Hello, welcome back to my network. We're at Wiser Money in London, and I'm with James Sykes, the CEO of Aceload Energy. James, good to see you again. Likewise, Peter. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, it's been um, coming up to six months since we've got an update, and there's been a hell of a lot of drilling since then. So, um, why don't, for those less familiar, why don't you introduce yourself and the company to begin with, and then we'll dive in. Okay. James Sykes, CEO, Baseload Energy, is uranium exploration company with assets in the Athabasca Basin area, northern Saskatchewan. We're exploring for near-surface high-grade uranium. And in our first drill program in 2021, we made a discovery we call it Accio. We've been drilling it off ever since and making new discoveries with every single drill hole. It's great. Yeah, we well, have been as well. So um, let's, let's, first of all, just remind us all of the capital structure, cash in the bank, that, that side of things. We've got about 120 million shares outstanding, and we have approximately 17 million in the bank. 11.5 million of that is committed to exploration in 2024. So we have to, we have to, ex we have to spend 11.5 million next year. It's a great problem to have, and I'm hoping that we can advance Accio, but also make additional discoveries with that. Yeah. Well, why don't we recap the last six months to begin with? Obviously, there's been some pretty punchy drill holes that have come out. Um, run me through the actual, the current exploration model and, and the way that you're looking at this project. Our main focus was on Accio this year, and we were trying to explore a number of factors. We were trying to explore the deeper mineralization and seeing how extensive it is. But uh, uh, trying to put a lot of things into, uh, or I guess drilling in a tight enough spacing that to try to get us to a resource calculation. So a number of drill holes fulfilled that. Uh, we targeted some of the edges of the pod to see if the mineralization would continue. And more recently, or I guess towards the end of the season, we were drilling into pod seven. We noticed that it blew away our modeled prediction. Uh, it grew in thickness, it grew at depth. We hit it at the, at the overburden contact and we extended it on strike. So pod seven kind of threw us for a loop, a very good loop that we were finding far more mineralization than we thought previously. So we think that, we, so that kind of deterred us from moving forward to the resource calculation. But that was, yeah, that was basically the drill program was ex, um, delineate and extend Accio. And now that we're seeing mineralization continue at depth in with some of our better intersections at depth, structures are there the alteration's still there we think that this whole system runs deeper as well we explored we drilled a some parallel trend to to the accio structure with five drills even those drills are all altered it's structural system and some of them were mineralized little skips of mineralization but it just means that the fluid system is still there in this whole area it's a big system and we think that those are the ones that that have the depth potential okay and so, so what are the main things that you, obviously you just, you, you found the parallel structure, you, you've hit some pretty high grade over at odd seven. In terms of the depth extension you were looking for, uh, did you, did you hit what you thought you were going to hit? We weren't necessarily trying to extend it at depth, not yet, but we're very happy with what we did ha hit at depth because that, that changed our priority for 2024 and 2025, that the depth extension is now going to be a, the next potential or the next priority. We still want to get to that NI43-101 mineral resource. We can kind of cap that off at mineralization above 200 meters, which would allow us to then focus on following mineralization below 200 meters, which we really haven't done yet. But so I know it's sometimes a tough question, but how would you say at the moment, obviously pre-resource it, it is hard to, to compare like for like, but based on the thickness and the grades that you are um, foreseeing within Accio, uh, how, do, how does that roughly compare to peers in the market? It's a very interesting question. There is no one-to-one. -one. Everybody knows the Athabasca Basin as high-grade capital of the world. Uh, a lot of our results have been very extensive. So we're, we're seeing vast thickness, or we're seeing quite substantial thickness in our drills. 15 meters, 30 meters, 40 meters of continuous mineralization. The grades are typically anywhere from 0.1 up to 4%. And we, in our last news release, we had a 4% over half a meter. That's high grade material right there within 120 meters from surface. Yeah. So the, the, the grades, the higher grades are kind of like the, the central of the central part of the pods and the pods and, and those are enveloped by a lower grade material, but the lower grade is still a mineable grade. If you look globally, 0.1%, 0.1%, if you're in Africa, that's high grade. Yeah. So at, if you have Rossing that could mine uranium at 0.03%, 
then why can't you mine at 0.1% or 0.3%? So yeah, we, we, we know that the grades aren't typical for what investors want to see in the Athabasca, but if you look at the history of mining in the Athabasca, they were mining anywhere from 0.1% to 0.4% in open pits. We have the exact same stuff. Rabbit Lake was one of the first open pits in the Athabasca Basin. Average grade 0.3. 30 million pounds of 0.3. That started the Athabasca Basin. That started the whole idea of unconformity mineralization. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing the same thing. And what about the scale of what you've, you've got so far? Obviously, you're talking about seven different pods there. Give us a sense of what the potential is in terms of within your own license area of how large this deposit could become. Oh, very big. Yeah. Well, they're not just Accio itself. So Accio still has room, especially pod seven has room to grow on strike. Uh, we also have to test it further at depth. We have to test a few of the other pods, like pods four and five, those have to be tested at depth as well. Uh, we know now that we have a better idea of what pod seven and pod four are doing, we think that we never drilled off the, the structure properly in previous year. So we're, we still think that the south target is open. Uh, as I mentioned many times already, the depth potential is there, some parallel structures. But the thing about Accio and the whole hook project, Accio is, you know, Accio is a dot on, on a big structure. That structure is about 15 kilometers long, and Accio is at the northern part of that. We go down to the southern part of that structure where we have other geophysical anomalies that we want to drill because they look they look very encouraging so the the potential is not just at accio it's for additional discoveries on the hook project and we think that those do exist and clint um so we for obviously you, you completed the financing that you mentioned in there you've got over 11 million dollars of flow, flow through that you need to spend next year on exploration when you were talking to investors when you were raising this capital what what were the use of funds that you were explaining what were you laying out that what was the game plan for next year? Drill. Drill, baby, drill. <laughs> we are going to continue drilling hard. Yeah. We've got four projects that we're going to try and drill next year. Where some of them are already permitted to drill, and then the other ones are in the permitting process right now. Uh, again, the, the idea is to extend Accio. That is the bulk of what we want to do next year. We've got 10,000 meters committed to Accio to, to continue extending it to try to get us to that mineral resource. We wanted to get to the mineral resource by the end of this year, but again, Pod 7 threw us for too many loops that we couldn't. So we will go back to it next year and, and try to get that mineral resource out. Hopefully we'll still have mineralization open, uh, open at depth. But another discovery on any other project as well, is is a boon for the company and that's what we want to do especially while the uranium market is hot yeah people will take note of a of a new discovery so it's so all me through next year obviously you you're saying there that you obviously drill baby drill which i love to hear um when could we potentially be expecting the middle resource estimate or does that depend on drill results it would depend on drill results but if foreshadowing what could be possible i would say december of next year okay. because we would need to complete next year's drill program get the assay results back and then we can start the process and then I guess the way that you're looking at it from moving into economic studies, do you feel like you'd be able to have enough based on that resource to, to do a scoping or a PEA? Or, or is it something that, again, maybe we'll do, do some more drilling to find the resource even further and then? Uh, personally, I think we'd be able to do it. You will? Yeah. And I, I, I believe that Accio would have enough. Uh, because, of its, because of its unique scenario being close to infrastructure, we're only 40 kilometers away from a licensed mill. Yeah. Uh, we, so we wouldn't have to build our own mill. The road, 40 kilometers of road is not that expensive. And it just, now is the time. But yeah, we, we think that there would be enough to warrant extracting that from the ground and, and putting it into the market. Okay. But again, PEAs would decide that for us. So obviously you just mentioned a mill there. Um, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about that because you, you were indicating that that's something that essentially, well, reduce your capex massively if, if you've got access to it. So, so who owns it at the moment? Is it on care maintenance? Is it in production? Just give us a bit more information on that. The mill, it's the Key Lake mill. It was a, uh, 200 million pound uranium mine. Uh, and that mill takes the material from MacArthur river and, and mills it through there. It's owned 85% by Cameco, 15% Arano. So two of the largest uranium players in the world. The, the mill's currently at 60% capacity. And I think they're even having trouble with supply chain issues. So really not 60%. There has been no guidance from Cameco about hitting 80% anytime in the future. Mm. So as long as there's still capacity at that mill, that's where we think we've got that window of opportunity to, to, to be able to toll mill. 
obviously that would be up to chemical and arano to 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 take our material but we like to we like to think positively and think that it would be it would be uh, amenable to a toll milling scenario and the other reason why i would say that is we've confirmed that our mineralization is all uraninite and that's what that mill wants it wants uraninite with very low deleterious minerals we have very low molly like ppm sable ppm values mills don't like molly we have very low arsenic very low selenium it's a very clean system so basically you take the ore and you put it through with with very little yeah deleterious minerals uh, so we do believe that it is a perfect fit for the key lake mill that's good well the next question i was going to ask you was is is a material suitable for the mill which big ticket is what about in terms of speeds of, of those around you i wouldn't mind understanding a bit more about the your comp not competitors but your peers in the region are there any other development projects nearby that potentially could reach production first and fill that excess capacity hmm it's a good question uh denison uh, denison are doing their own thing there's really nobody using key lake mill there's nothing in the pipelines yeah. that's because most of those deposits are in the sandstone we're outside of the sandstone sandstone's proven to be the geoengineering nightmare yeah and we've solved that problem i, I, I solved the problem what we'll, we'll yeah. about that you find de find deposits without sandstone on top <laughs> just look for the basement rocks where you don't have the water issues yeah because classically historically those are the ones that have gone into production yeah. over over uh what is it over f close to 500 million pounds have come from open pit mines in saskatchewan yeah that's a big number yeah i guess i guess to sign up you're you're in a an environment where Uranium is the best performing commodity of 2023. We're, we're at 80, 80 bucks a pound. Um, how are you looking at the uranium? You've been in this industry for quite a significant amount of time now. I guess I guess in your mind, this was always going to happen. Uranium had to catch up. But I wouldn't mind sort of seeing in your mind, is this a short-term reaction or is this something that hopefully is the kickstart to a new revitalization within the uranium industry? This is the latter. This is definitely a kickstart to revitalization of the nuclear industry. There's a lot of similarity. Well, actually, there's not a lot of similarities with 2005. The only similarity is the price taking off. We, as you mentioned, we hit $80 a pound. Six months ago, price of uranium is at 50 bucks a pound. That's 60% growth in six months. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. What other commodity does that? In this market, none. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still... With, but, Last in, in the last bull cycle in 2005, you had production coming out of Australia, Africa, Kazakhstan, North America, in the States, in Canada. It, basically, every continent was producing uranium. The demand was there. The supply was there. The difference that we are seeing now is that the demand is even higher and gaining speed quicker because you've got China building out five reactors a year. Nobody was doing that in 2005. Yeah. And the supply's not there. So Australia's not mining as much, and Ranger shut down, so that was their big mine. Africa's basically on care and maintenance. The states aren't mining. Kazakhstan's on care and maintenance. So it's Canada, basically. They're 60% they're of what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. So there's that whole supply side, and with the coup in Niger, you know, DASA suffered from that. Uh, Arano's, Arano's project suffered from that. So there's that whole supply side is very questionable right now. And that's what's driving these prices up very quickly. It's not, and no mine is going to be turned on with the flick of a switch. It's going to take a while to, to bring a lot of these mines back into production, bring them off care and maintenance. So that price will continue to rise, to rise higher. It'll probably peter and come down, but it's still going to stay at very high levels. Well, one of the, you mentioned care and maintenance mines there. Actually, I wouldn't mind talking to you about that because I've spoken to a lot of people about this topic with uranium is it, there are a lot of mines that have closed down that are on care and maintenance. Is, is there a risk of oversupply from bringing those mines back on? For, you'd assume there'd be some the first ones to come back on owned by large corporations in Canada and, and Kazakhstan. I don't think so. I, again, because these the demand is higher. The just that that demand is so imbalanced by the potential supply. Even if they do get brought brought back on, uh, lit Rangers Rangers done for good, and that was a big mine. That was a two hundred million pound deposit that that supplied quite a bit. 
so it's 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 not a yeah, it's it's not an easy thing and i don't think they can oversupply a lot of the a lot of the current operations uranium operations are isl they're about 60 percent um, of uranium production right now it still takes a while for an isl operation to get off care and maintenance and get and get back on track but when they produce they're not producing like hard rock mines can where they can pump out 10 million pounds or 25 million pounds a year those operations are typically uh, aside from kazakhstan those those operations are typically 1 million pounds sub 1 million pounds so that they, they can't oversupply the market themselves you need the hard rock mines if next gen's arrow comes online i i don't even think that could oversupply the market you know it's we're, we're in a very fortunate situation that there's longevity to this one. I think as well, you, you were sort of mentioning that there are going to be peaks and troughs, but of course, and I guess one of the main questions, I know you're still a while away from that. You're, you're, you're still yet to bring out your resource, but in terms of mining costs in Saskatchewan, obviously CapEx wise, there is a lower cost route through the mill that's next door. But in terms of the actual operating costs in Saskatchewan, in, in geology, uh, the geology that you're, you're based in it, Roughly speaking, it, it, is that is that usually higher cost or lower cost than than I guess the peer averages across the world? It's actually a good question. Those are numbers that I haven't crunched myself. Um, I, yes, okay, they are they are typically lower, yeah, because the grades are typically higher. Uh, African operations, which are usually the lowest grade mining operations, uh, historically were anywhere from sixty to eighty dollars pound operating cost. Uh, Athabasca, if you look at Chemicals operations, out there anywhere from 15 to 20 million or $20 a pound. It's a very low, very low uh, operating costs. Other operations, other operations around that $40 cost. And that's honest. That's what I think Accio would be, would be more of a sub $40 cost. But again, I, I, I honestly can't say that. No, it's, it's way too early yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. James, just before we leave, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Wrapping everything up. Accio is awesome. Simply put, yeah. near surface high grade mineralization doesn't get better than that. Now, next year, as I said, we're, we're, we've got 11.5 million to spend. It's going to be an amazing year next year. And I hope that, I hope we see more at Accio and I hope we make another discovery. That'll just, that'll be the, the topping. I, I've told many people that, you know, what's better than making a discovery? Making two discoveries. <laughs> uh, That's what we're after. James, I hope you're right. Thank Good to see you. Thank you. Excellent, Peter. Good.